28. Back to present. High above me. Ilaria shakes hands with Skeleton, bone to flesh, and the deal is sealed. She passes him the bone scroll tube with the map. The undead skeleton sits back, puts one bone hand to the tiller, spreads the magical map over a knee with the opposite foot. A skeletal finger draws a line across the map, and suddenly the ship lurches into motion. A cheer bursts unbidden from the crew. Hooray! <laughs> the flying black ship raises up into the clouds, just as a gang of bowmen made up of local farmers and the city watch loose a batch of arrows. The arrows pass through Skeleton's empty frame without slowing down. One of these finds Narls' shoulder, and the mage winces in pain. Nevertheless, he proceeds in his reading and turns the page with a grimace. Ilaria peers over the side of the boat, ill with the motion, seeking a point to anchor her queasy stomach. She spots Phoebe standing among the archers on the hill below, that traitorous ranger. He shouts her a smile as he knocks another arrow. At least he's happy. The ship lurches and gains more altitude. The township of Ya'aman below sighs its farewell in the form of laundry fires set along the eastern wall. Lyre coughs and closes her eyes as the ship passes through. The smoke reminds her of Rose, unseen since her fireball attack on the boat. Lyre opens her eyes to a broad inlet as the ship moves down the delta and over the sea beyond. The islands stretch ahead and beyond them, the wide open ocean. Looking back the other way, Shagal Umruk sees the long road he's traveled to get here. He points out to Narls, their starting place, on a far mountain in the distance. From the safety of the water box, Triton thanks Ilaria for healing his wounds. I heal my own wounds, Shagal barks. Pain is a weak memory for Shagal. Stronger is the remembrance of walks in the wild. He never slept for more than a few hours at a time, always alert for the circling of wolf, the track of orcs, or the hunting of humans. There were no friends on that long road, or only one, Shigal thinks as his gaze shifts to his wizard companion. He yanks the arrow out of Narls' shoulder and applies a leafy mash he's been chewing on to the hole. The arrow has come out clean. Shigal regards the tip. No poison, no serration, a hunting arrow. No steel, just wood, carved and hardened with fire. Chagall chucks it at a seagull, fluttering to a landing on the ship's side. The bird thinks better of the perch and dives away. Arrows are for cowards. If Chagall's brother knew he traveled with a magician, they'd challenge him. Too bad they're all buried far away in the wastes. Chagall can just make out the edge of the colder country, far to the east and the north in the darkest part of the world. This ship that rides the airwaves is headed the other way, toward the hot air of the south and the longer light of the west. A magical map is somehow guiding the boat. Triton orders tightening on the jib. There are two metallic sails, apparently, a main one and a smaller triangle set up on the far side of the main mast, closest to the front of the boat, the prow. Steel ropes that bite the hands lead to them. The barbarian pulls sometimes one, sometimes another, like a giant puppeteer, two heavy leather gloves on his hands. But Chagall feels like the puppet. Whatever keeps the boat in the air has nothing to do with these sails. The only thing Chagall is sure of is that when the skeleton touches the map, the boat moves. And when she doesn't, it doesn't. We're all being moved by your little finger, Skeleton. Triton wasn't so sure that was the only thing powering the boat. I'm not sleeping while she's awake. Triton, the turquoise pirate, points to the crow's nest. He means Rose, but she is not visible, or not there. 
The silver sail seems to take the heat of the sun and resonate, warming the air around the ship, creating a kind of bubble. They're not wind sails. They're sun sails, he says. Skeleton nods. It's the first gesture the creature has made since it took over the tiller. There is a chain connected to a sundered manacle next to Skeleton's foot. Were you always the pilot of this ship, Skeleton? asked Triton. Skeleton nods no and points to the fields below. They certainly work you to the bone, Triton says dryly. Edmund withdraws a spyglass from his traveling chest, pulls it to full length, and peers down, where Skeleton's pointing. To the bone, indeed. All our labor problems solved, says the nobleman eagerly. It's genius. Of course, that's why there was such a demand for whole skeletons. It's nice to finally see where the family fortune came from. Is that what you wanted me to see, Skeleton? Skeleton continues to point a bony finger. Gnarls waits patiently for Edmund to hand him the spyglass. His hand open. Edmund decides to look again himself. He points the glass back to where they've come from. There's the river. And tracing back from it, he can find, but it can't be. Edmund's country estate is ruined, ransacked. Everything has been mounded in the yard. There is wood furniture in one pile. Nearby is a stack of ceremonial armor, pots and pans. You make out the jewelry that's been thrown into one, and in a third pile are fine fabrics and bolts of cloth from your collection. And there, your childhood rug that you had shipped specifically. <gasps> My house! Edmund cries. The front door has been ripped off and a hole about 20 feet high made in its place. The sides have been removed from the barn as if someone walked up and just tore them aside like wet pasteboard. At last, Gnarls takes the spyglass as Edmund stares into the distance, blinded by tears. In the fading light, it's hard to find things at first. Gnarls begins with a farm not far from the city walls, one he passed on his way in. The fields are worked with an otherworldly consistency of effort, pace, and motion, and that's because they are worked by automatons, living skeletons. Here, rows of skeletons direct plows pulled by skeletal horses. There, a cluster of skeletons pull apples from a tree. One's arm falls off into a bucket. It goes on plucking apples with the other arm, soon losing its balance and falling out of the tree into the apples, only to try and climb clumsily up again. Gnarls passes the glass to Ilaria. She gasps in shock. You've escaped, Ilaria says after looking through the glass back at Skeleton. Skeleton lowers his pointing arm and nods. Lyra scrambles down from the crow's nest and has a look herself. At the edge of a row of farms, she's found a boat. She'd never suspect that it is floating in midair. If an enormously tall person hadn't just walked underneath it, climbed up a barn, and then, pulling the anchor line, stepped into the boat. It seems just the size for him. He turns to look up into the sky and pulls a spyglass from his own belt. He points it straight at Lyre. This isn't your boat, is it, Skeleton? Asks Lyre. Skeleton shakes his head. No. It isn't roses either, I imagine. Rose announces herself at last at the top of the crow's nest by telling everyone how short they are and laughing as they scramble to hide when she pulls a little bundle of fire out from behind her ear. Her next instantiation comes as the night wears on. At first, the source of the howling is thought to be the wind, and then a dream, and then to be a spirit or a ghost. Finally, Lyre fingers it, Rose. No one can sleep, aside from Narls and Chagall, who drip wax into the bowls of their ears. 
Orc ears can take a full candle each before filling up. The sounds take shape as a grumble about pain in the hip, and then it's a nasty slice she suffered. As the world quiets and the wind rushes by, Rose's moaning becomes the constant refrain. Lyre's attempt to play a song over it does nothing to quell the drone. Finally, even Edmund begrudges that Ilaria should heal Rose. Many had thought him gone, but he steps out of some shadow only to slink into another. A boat is only so big, yet somehow Edmund's absences make it bigger. Rose will not go near Ilaria, though, and it is up to Lyre to try a peppery herbal compress. Please, an herbal compress? complains Rose. This would aggravate a human wound, Ilaria explains. That's why I'm using it on you. Rose demurs, convinced. The combination of acids and spices seem to have a good effect. At last, the whining stops, and the imp seems humbled. Rose reassures the crew, promises she won't throw another fireball, with the sole exception of the boats being overrun by assailants. I I made this promise on my name, so I have to keep it. You understand. This dubious caveat is delivered just a little too smoothly to seem like a sincere promise. Triton attempts to sleep in his water box, His skin is now extremely wrinkly below the neck. Three water flasks filled with air, tied around his head, provide a floating pillow. Is this your boat? Ilaria asks. I've healed you. You can answer me this question. You do owe me. No further questions, thank you. Rose retires to the far side of the crow's nest. Ilaria takes a step toward the imp, but slips and falls. She'd blame her natural clumsiness, but her boots have been laced together. As she untangles the mess, she pulls her fingering away and puts it in her mouth. Ouch. The laces are scalding hot. <laughs>